Hey, welcome. In this video, I'm going to describe something called the definite integral. I want to motivate the idea of definite integrals and kind of motivate the entire concept of integration with a finance example. I want to build, I want to go through, through the building of a mathematical model with you, a very simple mathematical model. We have our, our f of t being the function that represents how much money is in a bank account t days, after t days. So t is time measured in days. The bank account initially has $500 in it and money is being put in or deposited every day. But that money changes as the days go on. In the first day, $4 is added. In the second day, $8 is added. On the third day, $12 is added. And it goes on like that every day, increasing by $4. There is no money taken out of the account, only put in. Part A asks us to write a continuous model for the derivative of f of t, for the rate of change of the amount of money put into the account. f prime of t, the rate of change of how much money is inside a bank account. So how do things change? Well, you can take stuff out, you can put stuff in. So the rate of change of the money is amount in minus amount out. How much is being put in? Well, on day one, $4 is added. On day two, $8 is added. On day three, $12 is added. So I can't say the amount f prime of t is equal to four. That's wrong. But I can say it's equal to 4x, or 4t rather. If I let t equal 1, so day 1, I get 4. If I let t equal 2, for day 2, I get 8. If I let t equal 3, for day 3, I get 12. So this matches the data. It increases by $4 every day. The amount out is 0. So I get 4t. And we're almost there, we almost have our model. Our model is f prime of t is equal to 4t with an initial condition. We have f of zero, how much money did we start with? f of zero is equal to 500. So that is a continuous model for how much money is in the account as a function of time. Part B asks us to find f of t, find out not the rate of change of how much money is in the account, but the actual amount of money in the account. So what we'll do is we'll use integration. We'll take the antiderivative. f prime of t is equal to 4t. So f of t is equal to the antiderivative of 4t with respect to t. We get 2t squared plus c. Now we're going to use our data. We're going to use f of 0 is equal to 500 to find c. So 500 is equal to 2 times 0 squared plus c. So c is equal to 500. Thus, f of t is equal to 2t squared plus 500. So that's our answer. So part a, this was our answer. Part b, this is our answer. Okay, question part c. According to this model, how much money is in the account after 10 days? So t is the number of days that elapses. All we have to do is plug in 10. So f of 10 is equal to 2 times 10 squared plus 500. So 2 times 100 plus 500, which is 700. So $700 is in the account. 
after 10 days. Now, I call this a mathematical model. Why it's a model and why it's not reality is that in reality, one pile of money is added into the account every day. This model is not a discrete model. This does not throw in one pile of money at the end of the day. It's a smooth curve. It's throwing in money every second. But it's throwing in that money in a way that you're going to add, it, add up the same quantity. This still results in a type of error. And I'll show you what that error looks like by doing a direct summation of deposits. What is, what is going to happen if we add up the, the total amount in the first 10 days? So we're going to get the initial amount plus day one plus day two plus day three plus dot 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 plus day 10. So that's going to be 500 plus 4 plus 8 plus 12 plus 16, 20. So I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now add everything up. So I got 12 plus 12, 24, plus 6, plus 10, 40, 60, 84, 112, 144, 180, 220, so 500 plus 220,720. $720. There are easier ways of adding up sums like this. There's shortcuts, there's formulas for adding up the sum of, of uh, sum of i, it's called, but we won't get into that in this course. These numbers are different because of the nature of what type of, of an approximation that we used. If I was to graph the two functions, one graph looks like a staircase. So the actual summation of money, we have our initial $500, and then after the end of the first day, we add some money, add some money, add some money. So it's like this staircase of money. And what we did is we replaced it with this curve, a straight line. And that straight line goes through the staircase. But it isn't exactly the same. So we, we do have a source of error. This isn't perfect, but it's faster than adding up the sum. It happens in this case that there's a shortcut for adding up the sum. There's a way that we could express the sum of 4 plus 8 plus 12 plus 16 in a very compact form. It is kind of beautiful, but I won't get into that. However, in general, summations can be nasty. And if we can have a shortcut to doing a direct summation using integration, it's worth the error very often. So I'll put almost. Now, what this, I am calling this a motivation in part because remember at the beginning of integration, I made a big deal or kind of a big deal about this symbol being an S that's been stretched and the S standing for sum, summation. I never said what we were adding. And what we're actually adding is we're adding up the value of the function at different points. But we're choosing so many points, it's kind of an infinite sum. And I shouldn't have said kind of, because it is an infinite sum. 
And if you take a different course, they'll get into how that infinite sum is constructed. However, even though it isn't part of this course, and we're not going to get into the summation notation and the, and the full derivation of integrals, I do want to give you a little bit more in terms of foundation and understanding for what an antiderivative or what, it, what an integral really is. And I use some geometry to do that. Well, we're going to talk about area in detail later, but to give you a preview of sorts and justification, motivation for what we've already been doing, I'm going to draw a picture of something, just a curve. It doesn't have a name. We'll, we'll give it a name, call it f of x. So here's our curve. Say so it does something like this. So there's y is equal to f of x. And I'm going to use a different color. I'm going to use a green x here. So it's a green x. It's not the x-axis x. And I'm going to imagine that we sh took a crayon. I don't have a crayon with me. I only have an, an electronic pen that doesn't really shade properly. Imagine shading that in. And if that was on paper, we could cut it out and talk about the area that's described, that's been shaded, how much area has been shaded inside that graph. I'm going to give, it a, I'm going to give that a name too. I'm going to say let a of x equal the shaded area. Right. Now I'm going to add, I'm going to imagine adding a little bit more area to this. I'm going to imagine adding this region here. I'll call this thing here, this gap from here to here, I'll call that H. So I'll add a tiny amount, maybe I'll add one more foot to the right, one more meter to the right, or some amount, to the, uh, one extra bit to the right. I'm going to draw a second graph here. Same picture, just to make the best, to do the best I can to make a copy of it, and we'll be perfect. That's the same y equals f of x. So here's our x, and here's our x plus h. And I'll shade that in a different color. Well, I'll do better than that, and we'll use purple. Use orange. And I'll give that a name. If this is a of x, then the other one is going to be a of x plus h. We can relate these to each other. So if h is small, so we only add a tiny amount, then a of x plus h is going to be a of x plus the extra rectangle. So a of x plus h is a of x plus, how do I calculate the area of a rectangle? It's base times height. So base times height. I need to get the height. So the height would be f of x. Oh, I should use the green x. It's f evaluated at that x coordinate. So I'll just be I'll be more careful with the colors here. Okay, so we have a of x plus h 
is equal to a of x plus the base. Well, how, what's the base of that rectangle? We're going from x to x plus h, so the base is the difference. Base is just h. And then what's the height? The height is f of the green x. Be consistent with my color. I'm going to rearrange that. So I have h times f of x is equal to, I'm going to subtract a of x from both sides, a of x plus h minus a of x, and then f of x is equal to, and then divide both sides by h a of x plus h minus a of x all over h. That might look familiar. It might remind you of something. And actually, I made an error. I'm going to replace all these equal signs with approximately. Approximately equal. A squiggly equal sign means it's kind of equal to this. It's, it's off by a little bit. Look at that triangle, the purple triangle. There's a little corner up here that's missing. So that's why that's an approximately equals two. We're gonna make that that little corner small though. Let h go to zero. F of x equals without any approximation the limit as h approaches zero of a of x plus h minus a of x all over h. Well what's that? That is the derivative of a. So f of x is equal to d by dx of a of x. Our function is equal to the derivative of the area function. Let's take the antiderivative of both sides with respect to x. So the antiderivative of f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative of the derivative of a of x with respect to x. And then that means the antiderivative of f of x dx is equal to a of x, our area function. That tells us that the antiderivative of the function is directly related to the area under the curve. So part of what we're doing every time we do take an antiderivative is you're obtaining some geometric information about the function. We're obtaining information about the area under the curve from some x-coordinate to some other x-coordinate. To get the full story, you'd have to take a different course. I don't, it would take too long, it would take about a week, maybe a little bit more, to go through the theory necessary to fully derive the relationship between areas under curves and integrals it requires a, a bit of work with something called in index notation and a little bit more work with summations. I'm going to ruin the ending of, the, of, the, of that story that would be done in a different course by just telling you the end result. The end result is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. If we say that the integral of little f of x dx, so it's antiderivative of little f, is capital F. We can define a related quantity. We can define the definite integral from a number to another number, from a to b, of little f of x dx. We can define that to be the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative at a. What this quantity would tell us, it would tell us the area under the curve of f of x from x equals a to x equals b. So inside this example, we'd be going from zero to the green x. So our lower bound would be zero, our upper bound would be a green x, and our area would be a function of x. So it'd be like a slider. You would slide that, that dot to the right and the amount of area would increase slide to the left and the amount of area would decrease. You could pin it down at a number, you could replace it with like a 10, 
and then that would tell you how much area under the curve there is from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 10. So that's the end of that, like that is the end of the story. If you want, if you go through a, a more theoretical course, you get to this. And you get to the interpretation of this in terms of an area. We're going to do areas later though. We're going to construct expressions that represent an area under the curve and then use this method of integration to find that resulting area. For now, I want to go through the mechanical process of doing these so-called definite integrals. Some vocabulary. The letters A and B that are appearing here are called the bounds of integration. And there's a, a middle step that I'll often write that the antiderivative of little f, the antiderivative of the function that's there is going to be a new fun the, the new function, whatever that antiderivative happens to be, evaluated from A to B. So there's this vertical line. This part here means evaluated from the lower number to the higher number. Evaluated at B, subtract, evaluated at A. So you plug in the top number that's there you plug it into the antiderivative, you plug the bottom number into the antiderivative and you subtract them. And that subtraction tells you how much area is under the curve, or for us, it tells you the result of the definite integral. So I'll show you with some concrete examples how these work. We want the definite integral from x equals zero to x equals one of the function x, x to the power of one. So I'm gonna first find the antiderivative. The antiderivative of x to the power of one is one half x to the power of two. There's no plus c. We're gonna evaluate this from zero to one. So since, well actually I will put a plus c. I will put a plus c, I'll just, just a few times, maybe just this one time, you know, and then you'll see why it's not necessary. Evaluated from zero to one, and I'm doing this, I'm saying that's the answer since antiderivative of x dx is equal to one half x squared plus c, just using the anti-power rule. Okay, now remember that notation is really weird looking, but all it means is take the number on the top, plug it in, take the number on the bottom, plug it in and subtract. So I get one half times one squared plus C. I'm replacing X with one, I'm not replacing C with anything. Minus, now I replace the X with a zero. So one half times zero squared plus C. So one half plus C minus zero minus c, I have a plus c and I have a minus c, they destroy each other, I just get one half. And I put a little note. You do not need the plus c in the middle steps. for definite integrals. Definite meaning with bounds. Because it'll always cancel out like it did here. It'll always disappear. Let's do another example. Antiderivative of cosine of x from zero to pi over four. Well, we know the antiderivative of cosine of x is sine of x. There's a plus c, but we know from the previous example that it's always going to cancel out. We're going to get a plus c from plugging in the top bound. We're going to get a minus c from plugging in the bottom bound. And that cancellation will just lead to pointless writing if we keep the plus c in there. Okay, so we're going to plug in the top bound. Sine pi over 4. 
plug in the bottom bound, subtract it, minus sine of zero. And then sine of pi over four is one over root two from our special triangle. Sine of zero is zero. So we just get one over root two. And that's it, that's our answer. So this does not mean you can forever forget about the plus c. Whenever the integral does not have bounds, we're still going to need it. But if the integral does have bounds, if there's numbers that are there, the plus c is not necessary. So just to compare these two beasts, these two types of integrals that we have now, these two types of antiderivatives. The first type, without numbers on the bounds, will always give you a function. There will always be a plus c. Whereas the second type, the so-called definite integral, does have numbers above and below the squiggly s symbol. At least, if, I mean, for us they'll have numbers. And if they are numbers, if the top and bottom bounds are, let's say, 3 and 7, or 0 and 8, or negative 5 and 6, then the result of the entire expression will also be a number. You can think of this as the old integration that we just went through with an extra step at the end. You take the antiderivative and then you plug in two numbers and you subtract the results. And often that's exactly how we will treat these. Or actually, usually that's how we will treat these. Once in a while we'll do something different. Okay, so there's two more examples. We want the antiderivative of secant squared of x, and after we get it, we're going to evaluate it at pi over 3, we're going to evaluate it at 0, and then we're going to subtract. But what is the antiderivative of secant squared? It's 10. So we have 10 of x evaluated from 0 to pi over 3. So that's going to be 10 of pi over 3 minus 10 of 0. I'm going to draw a special triangle because I don't want to get it wrong, don't want to have the wrong answer. We have our pi over 6, our reference angle pi over 3, and our sides 1, 2, root 3. 10 of theta is opposite over adjacent. So opposite the pi over 3 is a root 3, and adjacent is a 1, so I just get root 3. And then tan of 0, shrink that triangle down so that the pi over 3 is a 0. And the side opposite to the 0 is going to shrink down to nothing. So we have 0 divided by whatever the adjacent is, which is going to be 0. So we just get root 3 as our answer. Or just memorize tan of 0, 0. Okay, next one. Oh, and I didn't even write that we can skip the plus c. but. It's, you know, it's my habit. You may need to force yourself to skip writing the plus C just after you got used to forcing yourself to write it. But that's how it goes. Okay, next one, same idea. We're going to take the antiderivative. We're going to temporarily ignore that there's a 0 and a 2 there and ask, what do you take the derivative of to get 8x to the power of 3? Well, we'll use the anti-power rule. We have 8 times the new power on x will be power 4. So we need to have a 1 over 4 in front. And this is evaluated from 0 to 2. So I'll have 8 times 1 over 4, so 2 x to the power of 4 evaluated from 0 to 2. You can do a simplification step as well. So 2 times 2 to the 4 minus 2 times 0 to the 4. So 2 times 16 minus 0, which is 32. If you graph 8x to the power of 3 and then shade in the area between 0 and 2 and use little squares, like use um, graph paper, you'll see that this is actually, this, geomet this result is geometrically true. 
and it will always be geometrically true. You gotta be a little bit careful with negatives. Be a little bit careful when the function dips to negative y values because you'll get negative contributions to the area. And we'll talk about that when we talk about area, area functions. I'll split the video here because we're at 30 minutes. We'll do more examples.